Gladiators entertained the Roman crowds 2,000 years ago, and they entertain us today in movies and TV shows. They are some of the most famous fighters of ancient times, but we know shockingly little about them. There are very few detailed descriptions of an actual fight, and the ones we do have come to us from unreliable sources like poets. We're not even sure what the exact rules of a gladiator match were. But today we are focusing on what we do know, not what we don't, and we are bringing you 10 10 noteworthy stories of gladiators who earned everlasting renown or infamy. Number 10. Flammer For the majority of gladiators, the most cherished weapon was a simple wooden sword or staff called a rudis. This is what they used in training, but it held great significance for a different reason. If a fighter made a great impression on the crowd, and more importantly the officiator of the games, he could have been awarded a rudis, which meant that he had won his freedom. Obviously, this was the goal for many gladiators, but not for Flammer. We know little about him, and most of it comes from the inscription on his grave stone in Sicily. He was a Syrian by nationality and fought 34 times as a gladiator. He was a secutor, a fortified class of gladiator who employed armor, a heavy shield, and a sword called a gladius. Flammer won 21 battles, 9 of his fights ended in draws, and 4 were losses, although he was spared from death in 3 of them. His final defeat cost him his life, and Flammer died at the age of 30. We don't have many detailed gladiatorial records, but this is one of the most impressive so far. What makes Flammer truly stand out as a gladiator is that he could have walked away from the life if he wanted to. He was awarded a Rudis no less than 4 times, but he chose to keep on fighting each time. Number 9. Carpophorus Technically, the term gladiator only refers to fighters who were pitted against other men. However, it is often used in a broader sense, and therefore also includes bestiarii, meaning men who fought beasts. This group was also generally divided into two categories. There were criminals who were sentenced to damnatio ad bestias, meaning they were condemned to be executed by wild animals. There were also venators, skilled fighters who chose to take on the beasts for money and glory. Of the latter, perhaps none were greater than Carpophorus. He rose to fame during the games of 80 AD, which were ordered by Emperor Titus to celebrate the finished construction of the Colosseum. Carpophorus so impressed Marshall that the latter wrote three epigrams detailing his exploits. He claims that Carpophorus bested a boar, a bear, a lion, and a leopard in the arena, and that afterwards he was still in condition to keep on fighting. He could have taken on the marathon bull and the Nomian lion with ease, and a single strike from Carpophorus would have slain the deadly hydra. He deserved all the glory bestowed upon Hercules because Carpophorus managed to defeat 20 animals on one occasion. It is at this point we should consider that Marshall was a poet, not a historian, so his artistic side might have flared up a bit too much when describing the exploits of this man. Number 8. Amazonia and Achillea Gladiator fighting was undoubtedly a male-dominated sport, but it was not entirely restricted to men. We do have historical evidence and records which shows that female gladiators did exist. These fights were certainly rarer, and emperors had differing feelings on the practice as they imposed various restrictions, culminating with Septimius Severus, who banned female gladiators altogether in 200 AD. The evidence for the existence of these women fighters, or ludia as they were called, is incredibly scarce. Unfortunately, we can only name a few of them. Juvenal, another Roman poet, mentions a beast hunter named Mevia. A 2nd century marble relief uncovered in modern day Turkey revealed the tale of two fighters called Amazonia and Achillea. They fought to a draw, and clearly their battle was popular enough that it warranted commemoration in sculpture form. Given their stage name, scholars believe the two gladiators reenacted the mythological fight between Achilles and the Amazonian queen, Penthesilea, during the Battle of Troy. In recent years, historians have also reconsidered a different statuette as depicting a female gladiator celebrating her victory. She is naked apart from a loincloth and knee guards and holding a scythe-like tool above her head. Scholars used to think that she was cleaning herself but now they believe that she was, in fact, raising her hand in triumph. The most exciting discovery came in 2000, when excavators in London yielded the first and so far only remains belonging to a female gladiator known informally as the Great Dover Street Woman. Number 7. Marcus Attalus Now we come to Marcus Attalus, a young combatant who might be responsible for the greatest upset in gladiator history. Attalus was a Tiro, meaning that he was a rookie at the start of his career. Despite this, in his first fight, he was matched up against Hilarus, an imperial gladiator from Emperor Nero's 
person or troop had accumulated 13 victories in the arena. Normally, most gladiator matches try to pit fighters of equal skill and experience against each other. In this case, though, the organizers of the games put a veteran against a novice. This was most likely done as a showcase for Hilaris, who, as one of Nero's gladiators, was probably very popular. However, the unthinkable happened. Attalus won. Not only that, but he continued his victory streak with a win over another experienced fighter named Felix. We only learned of Marcus Attilius's impressive start to his gladiatorial career from some ancient graffiti. Unfortunately, we have no idea how it ended. Number 6. The German For this next fighter, we don't even know his name, we just know that he was a German man working in a training school for wild beast gladiators. But it's not who he was that made him remarkable, but rather what he did and how he did it. Besides proper gladiators, the arenas featured many wretched men whose sole purpose was to have a violent, gruesome death to satiate the bloodlust of the crowds. These showcases typically took place around midday, which more or less made them the Roman version of a halftime show. As you might imagine, many of these condemned men would have preferred a quick suicide instead of being mauled or butchered for the benefit of an audience. However, such a death would be a waste of money for the organizers, which is why they kept these doomed men under strict guard and made sure that they had no access to weapons of any kind prior to entering the arena. Seneca was one of the few Roman statesmen who spoke out against this practice. He said he was disgusted by this cruel slaughter put on to distract the plebs while the aristocrats left for lunch. He also told us of the German who went to extreme lengths in order to go out on his own terms. In Letter 70 of his collection of moral epistles titled On the Proper Time to Slip the Cable, Seneca talks of suicide as being a positive thing used to break the bonds of human servitude. He brings up the German who went to relieve himself before his fight as it was the only time he was left unguarded. He grabs the only thing he could find, a stick with a sponge devoted to the vilest uses. In other words, just in case you didn't know, Romans used that to wipe their butts. As it was, the German, a brave fellow, as described by Seneca, shoved it down his own throat and choked himself to death with it. It. Number 5. Priscus and Verus Not a lot of information has survived about specific matches, but there is one which withstood the test of time, the fight between Priscus and Verus. We know of it courtesy of the poet Marshall again, as this was a match that took place during the same inaugural games where Carpophorus was slaying every beast in sight. The fight between the two men was described as the highlight of the opening ceremonies and remains the only known detailed account of a gladiator match. Priscus and Verus fought well and hard for a long time and appeared to be evenly matched. The bout went on so long that people from the crowd started shouting for the two combatants to be discharged. Emperor Titus, however, stuck to his rule that the fight only stopped when one of the gladiators raised a finger, which meant that he yielded and was pleading for mercy. Eventually, both Priscus and Verus raised their fingers at the same time. As a reward for their valiant efforts, Titus awarded both men Arudus and the prize of the match. Marshall made use of his poetic license again and ended the epigram with a tribute to the emperor's benevolence. Under no prince but thee, Caesar has this chanced, while two fought. Each was victor. Number 4. Diodorus Is it possible that a blown call from a referee could cost a gladiator not only the match, but also his life? Well, it would appear that this was the case for one unfortunate fighter named Diodorus. All we know of him comes from the epitaph on his marble tombstone found in Samson on the northern coast of Turkey. It reads, Here I lie, victorious, Diodorus the wretched. After breaking my opponent Demetrius, I did not kill him immediately, but murderous fate and the cunning treachery of the Sumerudus killed me. Usually, the inscriptions on gladiator tombstones only provide modest information such as their names, their win-loss record, and perhaps how they died in the arena. That alone makes this grave marker unique and invaluable. It also provides us with significant proof that maybe gladiator fights were not all brutal melees with no regards for rules. They even appeared to have referees called Sumerudus who were there to make sure that the fighters adhered to the guidelines. At the same time, though, it is also worth mentioning that Diodorus's tombstone was dated to the 2nd and 3rd century AD. D. Gladiator fights had existed for almost 500 years by that point, so it is also likely that the rules had changed and evolved over time. During Diodorus's time, at least, scholars believed there was a rule in place which allowed a gladiator to get up if he fell accidentally, but not if he was knocked over by his opponent. According to the epitaph, Diodorus fell Demetrius and had victory well in hand, but the referee intervened. The Sumerudus mistakenly believed Demetrius had fallen down by accident and allowed him to get up and retrieve his weapon. He subsequently 
ended up killing Diodorus. Number 3. Speakerless In the case of Speakerless, it wasn't what he did in the arena that earned him fame, but his life afterwards. We don't know much about his gladiatorial prowess, but we do know that he performed well enough to earn the favor of Emperor Nero. In fact, Nero not only awarded Speakerless his freedom, but he made him a Roman citizen of high social rank and gave him vast lands and fortunes. Nero appointed Spiculus commander of his personal horse guard, a unit which he held in very high esteem. His trust was well placed, as the emperor truly earns the former gladiator's undying loyalty. When the plot to overthrow Nero was enacted, his praetorians betrayed him, but the horse guard, led by Spiculus, did not. Eventually, the rest of the guardsmen abandoned the emperor, but Spiculus remained loyal and was lynched by an angry mob as one of Nero's men. It was later reported that in his final hour, Nero was looking for Spiculus, as he wanted the gladiator to be the one who would deliver the killing blow. Number 2. Commodus The emperor always experienced the gladiator fights from a special luxurious box, not from the arena floor in the middle of the action. That is, unless the emperor in question was Commodus. Let's make this clear from the start. Commodus was insanely cruel and egomaniacal. He saw himself as the reincarnation of Hercules and looked for any opportunity to show off his physical prowess. Of course, he couldn't resist the allure of the arena. All his fights were fixed, obviously. His opponents always submitted and he was never in any physical danger. When he slew animals, he did it from an elevated platform that kept him out of harm's way. According to Cassius Dio, he killed a hundred bears in one day this way. Shockingly, Commodus restrained himself and used a wooden sword when fighting against gladiators. He wasn't so merciful when he was training at home as there he wielded a steel blade. He enjoyed slicing off the occasional nose and ear, and as Dio put it, he also managed to kill a man now and then. The most shocking moment occurred when Commodus had all the crippled men in Rome rounded up and fastened them together at the knees in the middle of the arena. He armed them with sponges instead of rocks and proceeded to club them to death, pretending he was Hercules killing giants. His gladiatorial appearances were poorly attended. Although Dio never said that Commodus actually did this, he specified that there was a belief amongst Romans that the emperor enjoyed firing off random arrows into the crowds in imitation of Hercules hunting birds. Despite his lack of popularity in the arena, Commodus was, without a doubt, the best-paid gladiator in history. He charged a million sesterces for each appearance, causing a steep decline in Rome's economy. Number 1. Spartacus Of course, the most notorious gladiator of all time is Spartacus. The slave who led one of the greatest uprisings in ancient history, which you can learn about in detail in our video about Spartacus on our other channel, Biographics, link below. In 73 BC, almost 80 slaves escaped from the gladiator school of Batiatus in Capua. Over the course of two years, they roamed the Roman Empire, led by Spartacus, amassing an army which, at its peak, contained around 100,000 men. The Spartacan army won victory after victory against the Roman forces, as the Senate kept underestimating the power and determination of the rebels. It was just beyond their comprehension that a group of slaves, peasants, and shepherds could prove to be such a challenge to almighty Rome. It wasn't until Marcus Crassus, possibly the richest man in Roman history, interfered that the tide started turning. Indeed, Crassus's forces eventually bested the slave army, and Spartacus himself was killed in combat. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that thumbs up button below, and don't forget to subscribe. When you're subscribing, hit the notification bell so you find out when we put out a new video. Also, like I said, why not check out Biographics for that Spartacus bio? It is linked to below. And as always, Thank you for watching.